Hey there, Auto50. So welcome to fuel systems. Um, in this lecture, we're going to talk about fuel delivery systems. In the next, we'll talk about, um, on Wednesday, actually, we'll go ahead and release it. We will talk about the EFI and the wonders of electronic fuel injection um, and how it controlled and all that fun stuff. Uh, today, we're just going to talk about components. So I'm going to go ahead and screen share with you. Uh, it's a little bit bright there. Let's talk fuel delivery um, components and their function. All right, getting into our objectives, um, not going to, uh, we're going to talk about some of the principles related to gasoline fuel systems. Uh, we're going to talk about the components, and then we're going to get into fuel filters, mechanical fuel pumps, electric fuel pumps, all that fun stuff. So our fuel tank, first and foremost, is pretty basic, uh, a storage device. Now they can be made of either plastic or metal. Most of the time these days are made of some sort of synthetic plastic material, some sort of composite material. Um, back in the day we used to use a lot more metal fuel tanks. Um, there are still manufacturers who do use metal fuel tanks. It's just lighter and cheaper to use plastic tanks. So that's what we see a whole lot. Now most of the time your fuel tank cannot be filled 100% to the brim um, because we want to leave what we call an expansion dome that will allow for fuel expansion with heat. So when we have temperature increases or decreases, we get changes with the size of our fuel molecules. Um, this actually plays a part when you go to um, fill up your gas. So you really want, in order to get all of the fuel molecules for your uh, buck, you really want to fuel up when it has been cold for a little while. The fuel is more condensed. Um, you technically get more fuel when it's nice and hot. Let's say at the end of a nice hot day, that fuel's been, been uh, sitting in there getting nice and warm for you. The molecules are a lot more uh, expanded and further. So when you're getting fuel, you actually get less fuel if it's, if it's hot. Um, because of that expansion, if we were to fuel Fill, fill our fuel tanks to the brim when that expansion happened, um, then we, we would have deformation or cracking and issues like that. So what we do is we put it in a, a, an expansion dome so you can really only fill the tank to 90%. Um, then inside of our fuel tank, we'll have some sort of baffle. Down here is a good picture. We've got what looks like these little walls. Um, the slosh baffle actually does a couple of things. So Design-wise, it's meant to cut down on fuel slosh, fuel moving back and forth. Uh, what we don't want is, especially when you start to get down those lower levels of fuel, when you go to take off and we get that weight transfer and everything wants to move to the back, if you were to have a water tank inside the car, you would see that water sort of move back. And when you stop, you'd see everything move forward. Um, and that's what your fuel would do. Well, the problem is if we're looking at this picture down here, if there was no baffle involved, we would get possible fuel slosh away from our fuel pump and fuel pump pickup area that uh, it would actually starve the engine of fuel momentarily until everything sort of leveled out and the fuel came back. Um, and so our fuel system would just simply be sucking air. And that's a big problem. So we put in baffles there to cut down on that fuel slosh. Um, but sort of just by being there, it also does happen to provide a little bit of rigidity for our fuel tank, which is nice. Um, here's a little bit of a different picture here. So there's our baffle, here's our fuel tank. Um, when we do get that uh, temperature change with fuel, when fuel heats up, it has a tendency to want to uh, vaporize or evaporate. It has a high volatility. So when that fuel wants to evaporate, it's very easy to escape out. And we don't want that to happen because it's going to increase what we call our HC or hydrocarbon emissions. So we have something in place here, right here, it's showing foam filters, but this is actually uh, gonna be a charcoal canister. So when our fuel does happen to expand and vaporize, um, not the liquid fuel, but the vapor, it allows this fuel vapor to be captured in this charcoal canister, also known as a fuel evap canister uh, that has charcoal inside of it that's going to capture that fuel vapor. Now, when you turn the engine on, you can see here we've got a line that is actually going, allowed to go to the engine. 
um, the engine is going to use up all that fuel vapor. So we're really not wasting anything. We're not releasing anything harmful out into the atmosphere. We'll get into evap canisters a little bit more uh, the week after next, our, our last actual week of talking about new material in emission controls. Um, but there is going to be a float valve. Most of the time, this is going to protect any overfilling from getting any actual liquid fuel into the charcoal canister because if any liquid fuel goes into the charcoal canister, you'll destroy the charcoal canister because it can't do its job anymore. Um, so there is a float valve to keep that from happening. However, you really push the limits of those float valves when you keep filling up the gas tank further and further and further and further and you do put yourself at risk for getting liquid fuel to come up and saturate your charcoal canister. So when you go to get gas, you know, if after a couple of clicks, it's you're full, you're good. Um, no need to do that like 10 times and potentially damage your charcoal canister. So just keep that in mind. We do have an atmospheric vent here. There's going to be a check valve involved because the last thing we want is any evap, um, I'm sorry, HC emissions evaporating out into the atmosphere. But again, we'll get into that um, more in a few weeks or a couple weeks here. So we are going to talk next about fuel, fill. That is a typo. It's supposed to say fuel filler. So the fuel filler neck is pretty much an extension of your gas tank. So down here would be your gas tank, and then we've got a fuel filler neck that's going to come out. Most of the time it's on the side of the vehicle, can be passenger, can be driver, depends on the OEM. And then um, there are some big vehicle manufacturers where it's actually in the back. But this fuel filler neck is important. It's not just a tube because anything modern is going to actually have something in it or the size itself is going to prevent the use of leaded fuel. So way back in the day, we used to use leaded fuel, um, partly, well, for a number of reasons to control volatility. There's, there's a few things. Um, it actually helped um, act as a better cushion for our valves and valve seats and things. Um, but it's really bad for your catalytic converter and it has a tendency to eat up oxygen sensors as well. Both things we really need, um, especially if we're going to pass smog, right, and continue to be efficient. So we don't use leaded fuel anymore. If you're using race gas, it may be leaded. So be very, very careful. If it's coming out of a gas station pump, at least in California, it's definitely not going to be leaded. So you shouldn't have to worry unless you're actually purchasing race gas um, specifically from somewhere. Um, otherwise, the fuel nozzle is a different size for unleaded versus leaded. It's smaller for unleaded. So our fuel filler neck is actually going to have either a restrictor or the size itself is not going to allow um, a large leaded fuel nozzle in. So you can't accidentally use the wrong type of fuel because that would be really sucky and can be really costly if you're eating up catalytic converters like that and uh, oxygen sensors. Now, sometimes a fuel filler net can also contain uh, something called a blowback ball valve. And this is a couple of things. It's to help keep, remember I just mentioned, um, talking about um, uh, fuel coming back up if you're filling it too much. So what we've got here is a blowback ball valve to prevent fuel theft and as well uh, to keep you from filling up the tank so much it actually comes spewing out. We don't want that. So the blood back ball valve will keep that from happening and it's also going to keep uh, any tweakers from uh, putting a hose down into your tank and siphoning out any gas. Um, so a lot of vehicle manufacturers put that in the filler neck as well. Now the fuel tank cap itself ooh, went too, a little too fast there. The fuel tank cap itself um, seems basic enough. Here we've got a conventional fuel cap. Obviously, older ones look a little bit different. Um, they all really have a similar, similar uh, job. They are used to keep fuel vapors inside the tank. Now, anything remotely modern, um, I think from the 70s, 70 70-something 70 on, the EPA required them to be non-vented to the atmosphere. Um, it's important, again, those HC emissions, we don't want escaping out. There may be some sort of pressure relief, but that pressure relief is not going to vent necessarily out to the atmosphere. Um, again, those vapors 
that I was talking about are generally going to go into our charcoal canister. Uh, there is usually some sort of pressure relief system involved if we do reach too high of pressures. But what's most important about your fuel tank cap is that it does have a vacuum valve inside of it. So when you're using fuel, that's going to be a pretty sealed system. It, and when you are using fuel, the level is going to go down in the tank and we are going to suck fuel from our fuel injector or wherever, you know, our, our TBI or our PFI or GDI um, to the engine. But as we're, think of it sucking uh, out of a straw, right? But if you ever drank, let's say, out of a container that uh, you're using a straw or a, this happens to me all the time when I'm drinking coffee from someplace where you go to drink it and nothing's coming out. There's obviously liquid in the cup, but nothing wants to come out. Uh, the problem is, is it's not vented. And so what you're creating is, is a vacuum inside. This will cause the engine to die because it can't suck fuel out. So we need to allow air in to keep from that vacuum from happening. And that's what the vacuum valve is inside of your uh, fuel tank cap. Now, a lot of vehicle manufacturers, because this is, this is a big issue with just the general public, people forget to tighten their gas caps quite frequently, and this causes a problem because our emission control systems, specifically our fuel evap system, is monitoring fuel tank pressure to make sure that there's no leaks. We don't want any cracks or anything. We don't want emissions leaking out. And so if it notices that there is a change, and I'm just simplifying this right now in that pressure, it is going to throw on a check engine light, letting you know that you have a gross evap leak, meaning a large evap leak, and it's coming from the fuel tank cap. But um, older vehicles don't really tell you that. They just tell you it's a gross leak, but newer vehicles will tell you that the cap is loose. Generally, they will see a big enough leak, and it's like, all right, probably the cap and it will tell you a lot of vehicles will tell you to check your uh, fuel tank cap to make sure that it's tight that is what that is for because i mean i, I can't tell you how many times um especially working at the dealer and at the uh independent repair facility that i was at for a little while that uh, the customers would come in with check engine lights for just that and we just tight make sure that you know the caps tight and then we would go ahead and clear it and the customers out on their way no harm no foul but this was sort of a big pain in the butt so a lot of OEMs did that now to prevent all of that just in general many vehicle manufacturers um, Ford as an example started using what we call a capless an easy fuel capless system so there actually is no cap you can actually see First, we've got a different type of seal on our gas door, so that's part of it. Um, and we have all of our necessary valves inside our sort of the top of our filler neck there. So there's no need for the gas cap anymore. You simply push the nozzle in, and you and you open up that valve there. It will allow fuel in, and then it's going to seal right back up when you take the nozzle out. And so there is no forgetting the cap at the gas station or forgetting to tighten the cap and getting a check engine light or uh, some sort of warning light. So uh, that's pretty nice, right? Um, the, oops. The fuel tank sending unit, let's see if I can get out of there. The fuel tank sending unit uh, is really what's responsible for telling you how much gas you have. So when you're looking at the gas gauge itself, how does it know uh, that you have a quarter tank or half a tank or a full tank? That is our fuel tank sending unit. Now, older designs are very much like this picture down here. Uh, very basic, basic, basic. Inside here, we actually have a variable resistor. Uh, many new model vehicles, their fuel tank sending unit still uses a variable resistor. Um, it just is incorporated as a unit. So what we have is a variable resistor here and a float. Now this float can be hollow plastic. Um, again, these floats do go bad. They can get just eaten up over time, they get a crack, and if it's the hollow plastic sort of float and fuel gets inside, then it just stays at the bottom and shows empty all the time. Sometimes there's styrofoam type material, obviously it's not styrofoam in the traditional sense, but it's going to be fuel resistant. Um, and 
this styrofoam is going to float on top of the fuel. Again, over time, these things get eaten up and broken up and cracked and chunks fall off and, and things like that. And so um, this float moving up and down when you fill um, or use up gas is going to change the position of, if you're looking at my mouse here, of this variable resistor. And we are gonna have some electrical leads that either go to the gauge itself, if it's an older style design, the DIC is the driver information center. So if you have something in your gauge set, maybe that tells you your fuel. Um, maybe it's uh, a newer design where it's, it goes to a BCM or body control module, which will then tell the gauge, um, which is what's really common right now and has been for a while um, to determine your fuel level to show you what the fuel level is. Uh, some vehicle manufacturers use a low fuel light that is incorporated in the system as well. But that's essentially, in a nutshell, your fuel tank sending unit. Next, uh, so if you look back at this picture, and I'm impressing my luck here by moving slides. Uh, if we look here, our sending unit is usually going to be a part of this whole, what we'll call a fuel pump assembly. Um, and inside, you'll notice, or actually even down here, even down in this old style here, this red here is our pump. Our pump's going to be located in here. Anytime you see this uh, sort of sock filter material, that's where our pump is. And that's why we're talking about this here. Fuel sock is going to be the end, at the end of every fuel pickup tube on the fuel pump assembly, wherever the fuel pump may be. Um, it's going to be the initial filter. It's going to filter out the larger particles. Um, it is not our fuel filter as you might know it. The fuel filter is going to be responsible for filtering out much smaller particles. The fuel sock is just sort of the first line of defense to keep any of the gunk out from your fuel tank. Um, which by the way, just randomly, I'll go ahead and throw this in here. A lot of people think that it's not good to, pit, to, to run on empty all the time in your gas tank because uh, it's picking fuel up from the bottom of the tank. News flash, it always picks up from the bottom of the tank, always. Doesn't change where it picks it up just because of where the fuel level's at. Uh, if it didn't pick it up from the bottom of the tank, then when you're, let's say, picked up at half a tank, then whenever you're below half a tank, you would not be able to use any of the rest of that fuel. So it's got to pick up from the bottom of the tank if you're going to utilize the entire volume of the tank. Well, <laughs> there can be gunk at the bottom of the tank, and that's why that sock is there. And then before, after the fuel gets pumped out and it goes to our fuel injectors, um, uh, let's say, whatever it may be, uh, then it's going to get filtered yet again by our actual fuel filter. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so we get no tiny particles because our fuel injectors are a lot more sensitive to any contaminants. Now, the reason why you don't want to run on an empty tank all the time, because that part is true, it will actually cause issues um, mainly with your fuel pump itself. Your fuel pump life will be significantly decreased because of cooling or lack thereof, not because of the gunk at the bottom of the tank, the fuel pump gets cooled by all of the fuel surrounding it. If it doesn't have fuel surrounding it all the time because you're on E all the time and you're just, you know, if every time you drive the vehicle, you throw five bucks in, um, that is why, because the pump is running at a much higher temperature on a regular basis, which for electric motors is going to shorten the lifespan significantly. So what you really want to do, let's say you are low on money and you can't be putting fuel in or you're putting little bits at a time when you've got it, save up a little bit, <laughs> fill up the tank and use half your half tank as if it was E. And so if you're always at least keeping a half tank in, then you're good and put $5 in from there. Tr treat that as your new E mark um, if you've got enough uh, self-control for that. 
Now, if you are going from full to empty, full to empty, full to empty, and you're using up all of the volume all the time, so if you fill up at the beginning of the week and you use up all the gas by the end of the week, next week you fill up again, that's totally fine and healthy for your fuel pump. It's when you're on E all of the time uh, that that's where it creates a temperature problem for that electric motor. So just keep that in mind. This fuel sock should be replaced every time you replace the pump. Um, and, and a lot of times your pump may come with a new sock, but if it doesn't, make sure that you do replace it. Um, let's get into our fuel filters. So it's just sort of in that same realm of things. We're going to remove small contaminants from the fuel with this filter. Very, very tiny, tiny um, contaminants. And this is to protect, again, our fuel injectors um, because they have very very tiny orifices that can get clogged and uh, we don't want that to happen so a lot of times these fuel filters so way back when we used carburetors fuel filters a lot of times were right next to the carburetor and they were clear and you could see through them and you could change them when they got dirty um, lots more than uh, after that when we went to fuel injection would put uh, the fuel filter kind of like this motorcraft one is so it's obviously it's a Ford somewhere around the frame rail in line with the fuel so we would have an in and an out and they are directional if you put them in backwards you may not have a vehicle that runs or you'll have intermittent issues um, so make sure that you are paying attention to the direction of your fuel filter now um, these would have a service life usually 30 ish thousand miles would be around how often you're supposed to change them. The mileage would change from OEM to OEM. Um, but most vehicle manufacturers have gone to what we call a fuel pump assembly, where everything is encased in one inside of the fuel tank. So in our fuel tank, we have the fuel pressure, or I'm sorry, the fuel sender, sending unit. We have the fuel pump along with the sock, and we have the fuel filter. Now, many of the OEMs that use this type of design will call these filters lifetime. I'm sorry, there is no such thing as a lifetime filter. What they really mean is the lifetime of the warranty filter. Um, this does cut down on cost of, of ownership, and people like that. Um, until they realize that it's not actually the job of a filter is to get dirty, right? So how can a filter be lifetime if its job is to get dirty? Eventually it's going to get so dirty it is clogging our system. And so that's what happens. Now you may get a fuel filter that may not give you problems until, shoot, 100,000 miles. But now you may not be able to replace just that fuel filter. A lot of vehicle manufacturers, Toyota did this, where you have to buy the entire fuel pump assembly. So the fuel pump's fine, the sending unit's fine, but only the filter's clogged, you got to purchase the whole thing. And you might be dropping it, you know, $800 or something ridiculous on an OEM style fuel pump assembly. Um, so there are pros and cons. How much does it cost to replace a fuel filter every 30,000 miles versus, a, you know, a fuel pump assembly every 100,000? Depends on from OEM to OEM, but uh, that that's how things have sort of, or the direction things have gone in. Um, the next component is electric fuel pumps. Um, there are different types of fuel pumps, but let's talk electric first because that's everything that we've been using, um, at least remotely modern. Uh, so generally, we've got either electric or mechanical fuel pumps. Um, older designs, especially carbureted vehicles, used mechanical fuel pumps that were located on the engine. Uh, anything after that used electric fuel pumps. Now these electric fuel pumps are located in the tank. There is a reason why one is located toward the engine and one is located toward the tank. Mechanical fuel pumps are really, really good at sucking. So the mechanical fuel pump is really good at pulling fuel from the tank that is far away. Electric fuel pumps are really, really good at pushing, but they suck at sucking. So if I was to put an electric fuel pump up toward the engine, where the engine is at uh, in, in the engine bay, it's gonna have to work extra, extra hard to suck fuel from the tank. And more than likely, you're going to see a reduced life in your fuel pump. In, in your electric fuel pump. Now, if you want to make it last longer, you can and allow it to work 
the way it's supposed to, you can go ahead and take that fuel pump and locate it or mount it closer to, as close to the tank as possible, if not inside the tank to make it a lot easier on that electric pump to um, take fuel from the tank. Now again, it's really good at pushing, so it can take that fuel and it can create a much higher pressure than, than the old style mechanical pumps to feed our, our fuel injection. We use electric fuel pumps, let's say on TBI, throttle body injection systems, and port fuel injection systems. We also use them on new GDFI, or gasoline direct fuel injection systems, as your low pressure pump. Now these can be pumping you know, up to 70 some PSI. The range is around 35 to 70 some PSI, depending on who makes the fuel pump. Obviously there are aftermarket electric fuel pumps that can do a little bit better than that. And then on our GDFI, we use a new style um, mechanical pump that is a what we call a step-up pump. Now I'm sort of getting into a few things that are uh, probably going down a rabbit hole I shouldn't. So let's go back to our just average low pressure, what we'll call low pressure, uh, electric fuel pumps. They do pump higher than old mechanical pumps. So I just want to really put that in there. Um, again, located mostly inside the tank. These types of pumps use a, a, what we call a PM or permanent magnet electric motor to drive this pump. Um, and inside we're going to have, there's a number of different styles of pumps I won't get into. Uh, we'll wait for a tune-up class for you to get into more of that stuff. It uses an electric motor to spin a pump that's going to push fuel. And that's, that's how far we'll get into that today. Um, now, there's a number of ways that this pump can maintain a particular pressure because most of the time it can pump a lot more pressure than we're gonna use or need. So we're gonna have some sort of fuel pressure regulation utilizing either a fuel pressure regulator up at the fuel rail or a fuel pressure regulator out at the fuel tank right next to the fuel pump that is going to sort of step down the pressure to what we might need or other systems may actually vary by pulsing the fuel pump electrically can raise or lower how much pressure uh, that our fuel pump is going to pump. So that's pretty cool too. Uh, down here we've got another one of those assemblies that I was talking about where it's going to include our sending unit, um, the pump, and the filter all in one. Let's talk a little bit about mechanical pumps. So the two pictures I have here of uh, mechanical pumps are actually lower pressure style pumps. Um, Older designs, uh, this is what they look like from the outside, are mounted on the side of the engine, and they generally pump a much lower pressure, you know, we're talking like less than 10 PSI to a carburetor. Um, newer pumps that are mechanical are what we call step-up pumps or high-pressure pumps. That is for gasoline direct fuel injection because of where they inject fuel, they need much higher pressure. Both of these pumps work in a very similar manner. One will have an electronic solenoid on it, while this uh, older design does not. Regardless, both of them, uh, theoretically, just down at the base of how they work, work really, really similar. So if you look at this top picture here, we've got our camshaft inside of the engine that is spinning, and it has a lobe that is specifically going to be for our mechanical fuel pump. And that mechanical fuel pump's gonna have an arm that rides on that camshaft. Now when the lobe spins, it's gonna push down that arm, which is going to um, either compress or decompress a spring, which is going to either pull up or push down a diaphragm, a rubber diaphragm inside. So that diaphragm is going to sort of do this sort of motion as it gets pulled up. It's going to suck fuel in these T's, this L and this T here. They're actually valves, uh, one-way valves. So when this diaphragm is pulled up, it is going to allow fuel in and when it's pushed down, it is going to push that fuel out the other side. See where you said outlet to carburetor here. Now, both of these are check valves in a sense that it's not going to allow fuel in the opposite direction that it's supposed to. So our fuel inlet um, is going to allow up and in, but not let fuel back down when it goes to push it. Or else it would just, you know, push and pull fuel back to the tank, and that doesn't help us. And also the, the same on our outlet valve, it's going to allow fuel out but not back up um, so we don't suck fuel back from our carburetor. 
Uh, it, as I said, it already uses check valves and a diaphragm, and that's just about as far as we'll get into mechanical fuel pumps in this class, um, but roughly that's how they work. Here's a GDI system. So that was an older design picture. This is a newer design picture. Um, I'm gonna talk about fuel rails and fuel injectors later on in this uh, presentation here, but you can see we've got a high pressure pump that is going to be next to our fuel rail. The reason why we have two fuel pumps in a GDI system is because we don't want 2000 PSI from the back of the vehicle to the front of the vehicle. That means the line I have to run is that super expensive and to save money and also to prevent leaks because that's a lot of space for something to go wrong. What we'll do is we'll have our low pressure, you know, conventional electric fuel pump in the tank that's going to pump lower PSI, you know, 35 to 70 some PSI. And then up at the engine where we need to step up that pressure in a GDI system, we'll have a step up high pressure pump that is going to pump high pressure to our fuel rail and our fuel injectors, which I'll explain more again in a few slides. But now all I have to do is have a much shorter high pressure line and we run less of a risk of, uh, we, we get to save money and we run less of a risk of fuel leaking. Fuel leaks are extremely dangerous, probably over more than any of the other, uh, few, or, or I'm sorry, liquid that can leak from the engine, oil, coolant, because fuel is flammable. And if we get a fuel leak that's spraying anywhere near something hot, we can potentially have a fire. Um, and so we want, we want to stay away from that, and that's why they do that. Now, if we're talking electric fuel pump circuits, if you watched the wiring diagram video, I actually walked you through um, a, a fuel pump circuit. So if you haven't watched that video yet, go back to my tracing voltage through wiring diagram video, and you can see what this actually looks like. This is a much uh, sort of more broken down a diagram without anything else in it. I, I go through, um, I think it's an 01 uh, MR2 fuel pump or something like that, but I, I walk you through this. So I won't spend too much time in this now, but what is important, and you'll notice a few things, um, our fuel pump circuit, A, when you go to key on, it will turn on the fuel pump for around three seconds to prime uh, our system to make sure it's pressurized and ready for our fuel injectors to squirt uh, fuel in when you turn on the engine. Um, obviously, it's not going to keep it on because if pressure is not needed, then it's going to turn it off so, so we don't have any other issues. The other thing our fuel pump circuit is designed to do is to turn the fuel pump off if the engine quits running, let's say, um, you know, stalls or something like that. You don't want to continue to pump fuel into a system if uh, that happens. So um, it's, it's designed for that. And uh, you can see down here, we've got a computer control uh, aspect and over here as well um, for our relays or controlling our, our relay function to power our fuel pump relay here. Now, another thing that a lot of manufacturers did, um, this one must be for Ford because it says inertia. A lot of vehicle manufacturers put in some sort of system that if you get into an accident, it will shut off the fuel pump. Ford's inertia switch, um, if, it get, if you get rear-ended, sometimes it'll, it'll click your inertia switch and it will turn off the fuel pump. Um, so there's a, a number of things in here for safety to, to keep bad things from happening, like the car catching on fire in an accident or um, things like that. Fuel lines themselves need to be rated for fuel, if the, especially if they're rubber. Uh, anything that is rubber that's not rated for fuel will get eaten up very quickly and the line will rupture. So make sure that it's rated for fuel. If it is for carburetors, not that big of a deal for pressure-wise. Um, so you can get any line that's rated for fuel. Don't use vacuum line or, or cool line or anything like that. Um, but if it is a fuel injection system, it's going to have a higher pressure um, than, say, something like I said, carburetor or even TBI systems. So uh, if we're running a higher pressure, we need line that is rated um, for high pressure or a high pressure line. So they're gonna have different connections. No longer can I use just a conventional hose clamp. 
um, on a pressure line. So that's really important to know as well. Most of your fuel lines are either going to be some sort of metal tubing, like in this picture here, or some sort of synthetic material like we have here in the top picture. Now, on um, non-high pressure lines, something like a return, a fuel return line, um, or low pressure fuel lines, they may use a rubber hose with a hose clamp. There's a bunch of different hose clamp designs. We talked about this in cooling. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time in it, but here are the different designs here. A lot of these are older designs. What you'll see mainly most common ones are going to be your spring clamps or your worm gear clamp here in the picture. Sorry, this is the best picture that labeled and showed all of them. Um, so our spring clamps are what usually the OEMs will throw on there. Most of the time, OEMs will recommend that you replace spring clamps anytime they're disturbed. Um, and so that's what I have here on the PowerPoint. All types except the worm drive uh, should be replaced when disturbed. If you're working on a customer's vehicle, that is good practice um, because the last thing you want is a clamp to fail, a 50 cent clamp to fail, while the vehicle is being driven by the customer um, if you just worked on that car. So that's just good practice to do that. On worm gear clamps, you uh, can adjust them. So unless they're actually damaged, you may reuse them. It's not bad practice to reuse them. Um, but most of the time, OEMs won't come with worm gear clamps. They will come with a spring-type clamp. So those are your hose clamps. Most fuel systems don't use hose clamps anymore, um, especially with newer stuff and GDI. We don't, we don't really use that anymore. Um, so most of the time you're, you're not dealing with this in a fuel system unless it's an older car. Now your fuel lines that are high pressure, like I said, those steel lines, sometimes composite lines or synthetic lines are going to have special connections because of that high pressure. I can't use a hose clamp because that pressure is actually going to blow the hose off. So instead we need to use a special connection that's going to keep the lines from from blowing off from that high pressure. So most of the time we'll call these a quick disconnect design. They're anything but quick if you don't have the correct tool. Just so you know, so the lines that uh, use this design you can see have this sort of ribbed edge here and here. And when the line is together, we'll talk a lot more about this when you guys get into a tune-up and electrical class um, because that's more engine performance fuel system related. Um, you're going to need some sort of special tool that will generally clamp around and release a spring tension inside those lines and allow you to disconnect those lines. Good luck getting them separated if you don't have the quick disconnect tool. Um, you will more than likely, if you start to get too stubborn, damage the line. Um, it says down here, line damage maker. If SST, that's going to be our special service tool or specialty service tool, is not used, each OEM will more than likely have their own sort of design. So as a technician, you're going to need to start uh, collecting these quick disconnect fuel line tools um, if you want to do that. Also, be careful anytime you're disconnecting these lines. Uh, make sure that the system is not pressurized. You are not depressurizing the system when you release the gas cap. Um, rather, if you want to depressurize the system, you want to make sure that there's not a ton of fuel that's going to come out um, during this. You are going to need to, what I would recommend is to somehow disconnect your, uh, turn on your vehicle, disconnect your fuel pump, um, whether that be a fuse or a relay of some sort but just for the fuel pump, and then let the vehicle die on its own as it uses up all of the fuel. Once it does, you can go ahead and uh, you know plug everything back in, but the, the system is gonna be dry, so when you go to disconnect, there's gonna be very little fuel in there. So just, just sort of a quick tech tip there if you want to um, make sure not to get fuel everywhere. It's not that much in uh, a you know your average PFI system, you will get a splash to the face if, if you're in the wrong position, though. You do not, do not want to disconnect any high-pressure lines um, because we're talking much, much higher PSI. Um, most high-pressure pumps, their max PSI is 2,500. Not that that's operating pressure all the time, but even if it's 1,000 PSI or 1,500 PSI, that's enough to break the skin, and uh, you'll get a nice little injection of fuel into your bloodstream. And I'm sure your body 
doesn't like that. So um, do not disconnect high pressure lines without depressurizing the system. Google how you're going to do that on the particular vehicle you're working on and do your research before you do that so you don't hurt yourself. Capiche? Okay. Um, whoa, that went... Oh, okay. It didn't jump. Uh, now let's talk a little bit. Uh, we, I, I want to sort of, I went from the back of the car and mo moving our way closer. Now that we know the fuel pumps and the lines going to the engine, what about at the engine, how we deliver our fuel? So I'm going to go from the oldest design to the newest design. Older designs used carburetors. Uh, I believe they actually outlawed carburetors 87, 88, uh, somewhere around there. Uh, late 80s is when we vehicle manufacturers were no longer allowed to use carburetors for automotive use. Uh, motorcycles and things like that were able to use them later on, uh, but cars could not use carburetors anymore because they were um, really bad at creating, or I guess you could say really good at creating lots of emissions um, coming out the tailpipe because they are not very efficient. So uh, we also were not able to get very good gas mileage out of these. They do well enough when they are tuned properly, but they are, are not very efficient. So um, what our carburetor does is it mechanically supplies the engine with an air-fuel mixture uh, in all conditions. And it does this. It's actually really, really cool. I don't want to get super into this. Um, but we are using um, a Venturi effect here where, I, I, let me point some things out here. So we're going to have, you can see from fuel pump, we've got fuel going into what we call a, a bowl, right? So if you've ever heard of that, a float bowl or a fuel bowl inside of our carburetor. And we're going to have some sort of float here. And we've got these little tubes that go into where our air is. Now, let me sort of explain here. We've got a butterfly here, meaning um, like a throttle plate here. We've got another one down here. I'll talk more about this when we get into a tune-up class. But as we have air rushing past here, it's going to actually create a pressure differential. Um, and so fuel is actually going to get sucked out mechanically and the higher velocity of air and all that fun stuff is going to affect how much fuel is going to come in to our intake, whoop, intake here and go down into, this is where our intake manifold is into our cylinders. So um, through our venturing effect, we are atomizing the fuel and mixing it in with the air. The problem is, is it is at the top of our intake. As the fuel comes out, um, no matter how atomized, it does have a tendency to stick to the walls of our intake manifold. And so we get a lot of fuel loss um, in between our carburetor to the engine itself. Um, it's actually not as good at metering, and that's sort of why it creates so much more emissions. Here would be a uh, much better picture of what one looks like. This is going to be an aftermarket Edelbrock one here. Um, but this is essentially what's going on here. Um, again, we'll talk more about this in a tune-up class. Now, here, another one's going to be a fuel rail. So if we're getting into what we call a port fuel injection design, instead of the fuel going to a carburetor, we're going to have the fuel going into a fuel rail along this line. This is an aftermarket one here. It's going to. Here's a stock one. So we'll have fuel coming in through here. And... Uh, they call this, even though it's a rail, they call it a manifold. Uh, and it's designed to act as a reservoir for the pressurized fuel. And here's our intake manifold, because PFI systems inject fuel in through our intake manifold right above our intake valve. So we don't get that same fuel loss through the intake manifold. Um, the fuel rail is going to sit right on top of our injectors and it's going to, if we, uh, th there's going to be a seal here on each one of these injectors that is a rubber O-ring that's going to keep fuel from leaking out. So when those O-rings do go bad, you can get fuel leaks from, uh, the top of the injectors. Um, and oh, I will talk about a fuel pressure regulator in a few slides here, but it can also act as a mounting point. So on the edge here, this top hat looking piece is what we call a fuel pressure regulator. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And if you're just wondering 
you're looking at a fuel rail on the other side here of that fuel rail is actually what we call a, a fuel pulsation dampener I'll explain that stuff later um, but it as our fuel injectors close we get pulses in our fuel pressure and that's what that dampener is for uh, fuel injectors themselves uh, there's a bunch of different types so as we go from carburation we go to throttle body injection and we go to port fuel injection and then gasoline direct fuel injection each one is going to use a different style fuel injector regardless uh, they they are simply a spring loaded uh, some sort of electric solenoid spray nozzle to spray fuel so you can see this sort of an x-ray version of ours here uh, we've got fuel in kind of like where our fuel rail was from we got fuel in here's our electrical connector and just like a relay it does have a, a coil of wire inside that's going to energize and when it energizes we're gonna have something because there's different designs that we can uh, have here that's going to move and allow fuel in and spray out this diffuser plate here and atomize. <clears throat> and so that's generally how fuel injectors work. Now, there are different designs, so it may be what we call a top feed. That's this picture here or on the left here where the fuel goes in at the top and comes out at the bottom. Or it may be what we call a bottom or side feed, um, like we've got here. So fuel will come in one side and then out the other. That's generally going to be used on older TBI designs. So I'll show you right now what that looks like. These would be our PFI, or port fuel injection injectors. You can see fuel atomizing uh, really nicely out here. We've got the rubber O-ring, like I said, on top. That is going to prevent fuel from leaking out of the, the uh, rail. And then you notice another uh, O-ring down here at the bottom. That bottom O-ring is going to keep air from getting sucked in. So that bottom O-ring, if it goes bad, you're going to have a vacuum leak. If the top O-ring goes bad, you're going to have a fuel leak. So just a little FYI there. Uh, TBI, or throttle body injections, are uh, is an older design. So we had carburetors, then TBI. I'm sorry, I'm bouncing back and forth here. Um, I, I should have uh, changed the sequence. But uh, the TBI is right after carburetors. And then, uh, so TBI injects fuel uh, at the top, same where the carburetor injects at. That's why it's really easy to convert carburetors to, or carbureted system to a TBI or throttle body injection system because they're mounted in exactly the same spot. So our TBI system is going to spray fuel rather than a carburetor doing it mechanically is going to have a side feed injector that's going to spray fuel. Now there's usually one or two right in this down here. It looks almost like a carburetor, but instead it has two fuel injectors that are side feed to spray fuel down. Um, again, this does it at the top of the manifold, and so we do get fuel loss throughout that entire intake manifold. So um, that's, that's why we sort of went away from this. Um, and then we went to our PFI, which, which I just explained. And then now we utilize uh, what we call GDFI, or gasoline direct fuel injection. Diesel has always used fuel injection, or for the most part has used fuel injection, uh, direct fuel injection. But uh, just sort of recently, we started uh, mainstreaming gasoline direct fuel injection in uh, automobiles um, for a number of reasons. There's some pros and cons and, and, and some challenges that are being worked through, but GDFI injectors directly uh, inject fuel straight into the cylinder. So PFI would inject it right above the intake Valve, so when the intake valve opened, uh, it would allow air and fuel in. GDFI systems don't do that. Instead, we've got an injector that's usually pretty close to our, our spark plug here that is going to inject fuel directly in. Now, these fuel injectors have to be a little bit different, and that's the reason why we need that step-up pump because now, remember, when do we inject fuel? We've got our four-stroke cycle. We've got intake, compression, power exhaust, right? Um, well, normally, we would inject fuel on the intake stroke, right? But the problem is, is as the fuel hangs out in the intake stroke, I know things are happening fast, 
but not fast enough. And so sometimes the fuel can condense into larger droplets. So it's actually much more efficient and cleaner to wait until essentially we're right where um, we're, we're compressing our air fuel mixture we're not at TDC yet, but we're compressing our air fuel mixture. That's when we're going to spray the fuel so it's able to stay atomized. It's pretty much right before all the action happens. Well, if we have to overcome the pressure of compression, then we're going to have to increase our fuel pressure. And so that's why I'm saying we're running pressures around 2,000 PSI or up to 2,500 PSI because we have to overcome that compression, that pressure differential. Um, so we have different injectors. These are going to be some sort of piezoelectric injector. So it's got a little wafer inside that's actually pressure actuated. So when we reach a certain PSI, then it will spray out. Um, but that's sort of just in a nutshell, the newer designs. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that is our, uh, our, th that is our fuel delivery components. Um, and in the next video, we will go ahead and discuss on Wednesday, we will discuss our electronic fuel injection and how it's controlled. And we're going to get a lot more into fuel pressure regulation, which actually I believe I skipped one slide here. Yep, fuel pressure regulator. Um, so fuel pressure can, uh, well, our pumps will generally pump a select amount of pressure all the time. We don't want that all the time, and so we have a fuel pressure regulator that's going to regulate the fuel pressure. We can have two types of systems. Um, so it's either going to be a return type system or a return list system. On a return type system, and I showed you guys this on the fuel rail, that's sort of what this looks like a little bit closer up. We've got a fuel pressure regulator that's going to have fuel that comes in. And in order to uh, regulate fuel, I'm going to talk a lot more about fuel pressure regulation in the next video. We are going to, um, we, we are going to monitor this, or I'm sorry, not monitor, but regulate this with a diaphragm and a spring in here. And you can see we've got a vacuum line up top. So what happens is when we have fuel pressure, um, it's not showing our fuel outlet here because it's sort of part of the rail. Here's our fuel rail, it looks like here. We've got fuel in coming in here, right? Just like this picture here. And it's not showing our fuel outlet. This is not our fuel outlet. Um, we've got, and it's actually, we can't even see the other line because this may be our fuel outlet. But there's going to be a fuel line in and it's going to provide pressure to our rail. Well, when it exceeds the pressure that we want, uh, the fuel pressure inside here is going to push up on this diaphragm, compressing this spring, and it's going to allow fuel to come back down out through a bottom line that's going to come back and return to the tank because we don't need that pressure anymore. So uh, like I said, in a nutshell, we'll talk more about that in the next video. On a, um, a return list system, we may have a fuel pressure regular regulator out at the tank. Uh, by the way, that vacuum line is to actually assist um, that diaphragm. We'll talk a lot more about what that's for later on. Uh, but just so you know, our uh, return list system may have a regulator at the back that doesn't utilize that vacuum line. Um, and, and again, we'll talk more about that later. On a return uh, list system may also not be regulated at all. Instead, we may use computer controls to pulse with the, uh, the fuel pump to sort of just pulse it at, to what pressure we want and, and regulate pressure by regulating in uh, motor speed, sorry. So hopefully that made sense. Um, that, that is the last one, I promise. So uh, like I said, on Wednesday, I will go ahead and release a video for how EFI works so I don't dump too much on you guys because I feel like lately I've been dumping too much on you guys uh, all at once. So if you have any questions, please make sure that you ask them anything about the homework. Make sure you guys are going to SI. Um, I feel like it's an underappreciated uh, section or, or tool in this class that uh, nobody's using. I have uh, seen that I've been talking to Jasmine and she says that not one person from this class is showing up and if you're not getting 100% on your tests, 
you are either not doing the homework correctly or you um, are you're doing it and you're not showing up to SI because if you were you would be getting a hundred percent on your test because they cover um, essentially homework questions which all you guys know are essentially test questions so uh, you know you've got three more weeks uh, you got this week you have ignition systems next week and computer controls and then we've got uh, emissions and then and then it's our final exam so um, if you're you're fighting your grade uh, or you're worried about that make sure you guys are showing up to SI she posts announcements for the zoom sessions every single Monday and Wednesday so just keep an eye out for that again if you have any questions ask um, and thank you guys for joining us <laughs>